want to know more to read my book, but you should. There are other ways you can find out more about what we're doing. Our, re our website is, is absolutely promised to be online in the next two months. Also, as we go around the world, people are filming us, people are, uh, our, our speakers have been participating in book launches, and you will see increasingly on YouTube. Just look, just just go on YouTube and look at the author's name, and you'll find them giving accounts of what they have to say, which is not to say you shouldn't buy the book either. And when you get that, that will give you an opportunity for feedback as well. Possibility of feedback as, the, as for all the website and so on. So we're, we're looking for a dialogue. We haven't left you much time, but we're very happy for any comments and questions. And I think I'm going to give priority to the audience and, and not how much time we're coming up at the end. So, yeah. Um. Rodrigo, your book, it, it sounds very interesting to me. My, my, my wife's uh, dissertation was turned into a, uh, a Palgrave uh, book on, on four financial crises. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it addressed questions of uh, whether Kindleberg was right and about, you know, hegemony and so on. And a lot of this stuff I don't, you know, I don't know that much about. But what, one of the points she made is that capitalism, although she didn't use the word that much you know, because of dissertation, is, uh, tends to use crisis as a way of launching sort of the next accumulation regime. And I came to this, uh, I'm glad I came because it's, it was very interesting. But, uh, I thought it was going to be like, what's going to happen next with world capitalism, which I, to me is a big question. Namely, uh, in terms of, of, of my wife's book, which is, is, is what we've seen from 2008 to like just recently, just the latest phase in a, in a series of crises that are not like, you know, the big one that I, I forget who on the panel talked about, like the one that's going to bring everything down. Uh, I do. Because uh, there's, there's another workshop here on catastrophism, there's a whole other question. But, um, like the stock market, I was talking to a friend last night, the stock market has recovered, and I think for a lot of people who were really particularly devastated by, by loss in the, of, you know, their, their um, retirement funds and so on, I'm wondering to what extent the recovery of the stock market has sort of mollified people, or are we, as capitalism just has just used the slaves crisis as a way of a new ca accumulation regime, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, just to get you. I was, uh, I was reading Leo Panitch's book on, on uh, the history of global you know, growth, making, making, many, making of, of global capitalism. He says, for example, that uh, that when the, the uh, Bretton Woods was abolished under Nixon, and then a couple of years later. Floating the uh, floating the currencies strengthened American imperial domination, uh, and he uses that as an example for his thesis that uh, in fact even the crisis itself that from 2008 onward has strengthened. Mm -hmm. I wonder how you might respond. Uh, all the questions so far for one person. Okay, I hope my question doesn't sound stupid, but it's about healthcare, and I was really interested in what you were saying about healthcare. Um, I actually wrote a paper not too long ago about the um, impact um, of poverty on mental health, actually. And some of the data that I found, I actually have a psychology background, so it was easy for me to get my fingers in there, um, was really overwhelming that you know now it's one of the second biggest burden of disease worldwide, uh, but also the, the high correlation between stress and mental health and correlation between stress and physical uh, ill health or illness. So did you take that into account when you were writing your book and how there's a huge psychological component and not just nutritional and, and how would you like, how did you do that? Because I haven't heard <laughs> Yes, but I'm not allowed to answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, who else wants to chip in? We can have another round later. We'll take one more question and then maybe get a round of responses. So, I'm sorry, I just I came very briefly and I came right after going. I tried to feed two birds with one crumb. I went to the eco uh, social eco social yeah. eco socialism horizon panel, uh, whereby um, what what I got from it for the first time I was there was this general feeling about putting a stop to all of this craziness. I'm not going to get into you know, theoretical things because I'm not involved in that area that you are. And um, you mentioned just now that um, hegemony never existed in the United States. I think many people would, you know, 
approach to it differently. But what they said in this eco-social play in a panel and that you seem to diverge from is production. I think the future of these people are thinking are visionary in whatever context they define it to be are seeing a different way of producing your rice and beans and vegetables and exchanging them. And that the state has a different, a, a, a different definition, as I hope the work has a different definition. So when they say stop this form or format or schedule of production, how does that mesh with what uh, you, you, you just highlighted? Well, first of all, because no questions were directed to Custis or Henry, you asked them if they had anything they would like to say on this, on the questions that have been raised. <coughs> Okay. Next round, we want a question for Henry. Actually, well, I've taken four, and we'll have a response, and then we'll come back and have another round. With us. We've got till ten past seven, so we've still got some time for. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, the question of uh, crisis, whether a new regime uh, will emerge. First of all, I think uh, what will happen out of the crisis will depend on sort of structures. So it's not. Um, uh, to sort of try to predict what will happen as a result of the crisis. You cannot predict it as, um, you know, being from the outside as an observer of a kind of uh, mechanical process. I mean, um, and um, if, I, if I were to sort of um, think about, um, you know, what is going on in Greece, for example. Okay. Um, what is going in Greece as a result of the crisis is an, an attempt of a very sort of ra rapid and violent restructuring of, um, uh, of society, which is a more extreme version, I think, of what's happening in other parts of, um, of the world as well. I mean, I will not necessarily try to say that this is what's happening everywhere as a result of the crisis. But um, it's not clear to me that uh, this restructuring necessarily implies the birth of a new regime. What's happening in Greece is like you have a crisis of the neoliberal model, and the way they try to deal with this crisis is through restructuring that entrenches this neoliberal model even deeper, destroying labor relations and collective bargaining rights, privatizing everything, and so on and so forth. And of course, the other thing, which is also an element of uh, the struggle in Greece, is that you also have the at the same time that you have the meteoric rise of the neo-Nazi, you know, right that I mentioned, you also have a meteor me meteoric rise of an anti-austerity left, who could conceivably, perhaps, um, I mean, they see themselves, they talk about being opposed to neoliberalism, they sort of uh, would see themselves as trying to introduce uh, uh, some, an alternative to neoliberal, a neoliberal model. I mean, the question remains, it's an open question whether they would actually if they get the chance whether they would be successful in implementing a different model. And it will also partly depend on what's go, what will go on in the rest of South and uh, European countries that are facing some of the, uh, of the same uh, uh, challenges. Now, about the question of hegemony, of course, you know, if you think about, um, you know, ultimately you <coughs> sort of trace this idea to, to Gramsci, it has an element, hegemony also involves an element of ideas, right? Trying to um, present a kind of narrative that uh, helps to consolidate the domination of one group or another. And one of, of the things that I think is uh, remarkable, and if you think about what's going on, Greece sort of exemplifies <coughs> that as well, is a sort of a, a shift in the way people imagine the future of, uh, of world capitalism. So in Greece's case, you know, um, the idea of Europe, the meaning of Europe for Greeks was similar to the sort of idea of development in many third world countries in the post-war period. So the idea was for Greeks, you know, being part of Europe meant convergence towards the richer countries. That we're part of this demo uh, dynamic region, we will catch up. That's the modernization theory in the post-war period. And what's interesting now in Greece is that this is shifted around. And uh, the narrative in Greece now is not that, you know, through participation in Europe we will become like Germany. The narrative is now 
that basically <coughs> if Greece wants to remain in the Eurozone, it has to become competitive by aligning its wages and standards and everything else to Bulgaria and Romania, because we're not competitive. So it's like, it's a sort of very interesting shift. It sort of takes the, the, the sort of concept of progress and kind of turns it upside down. So when we think about hegemony today, and the struggle of a hegemony in the context of the crisis, it's interesting to sort of take that into account and sort of figure out what the, the meaning of this shift uh, is all about. Yeah, okay, so uh, to Louis, um, actually I, I have a, a certain as far as financial crisis are concerned, part of my argument is that people use the term financialization as though it was some kind of simple uniform uh, uh, phenomena that affects all countries, but in reality, there have uh, certainly been a series of distinct financializations in different parts of the world. And also, if you take the world as a system as a whole, recent financializations have been uniquely dollar-centered and US-centered. And this is because this is what has been necessary, to give the dollar that liquidity that keeps it as a reserve currency. And until, uh, in the, except in 1987, and then subsequently in the 2000 and, and now, the U.S. was able to externalize the costs of this financialization, but eventually the chickens came home to roost, and uh, so this is what you see. Um, the idea that uh, and capitalism uses crises to launch the next accumulation regime, and uh, and this whole idea that you know when Bretton Woods was abolished, the U.S. dominance was strengthened. I mean, these are practically religious ideas. You know, in the in the medieval times, you were told if something good happens, this is the hand of God in the world, and if something bad happens, it's also the hand of God in the world. So, I mean, there is a sense in which uh, this this has been the nature of the argument. And I think that you really do have to, I'm sorry to, to say this, but, but look at the evidence I present. Because you look at the real story, you will suddenly, why, you will realize, why did we ever think so? Why is there, uh, why were these um, discourses ever believed? And I think there are many elements to the argument. One element is that, you know, uh, the, uh, there was in the 19, uh, roughly around the same time as the dollar was abolished, the Bretton Woods was abolished, a new discipline came into existence. It became came to be called international and later global political economy. And it was supposed to be an international discipline, but if you actually really look at it, it's, it's basically US-centered. And when you teach IPE, which I have done on and off, you are, you are, you, in the textbooks they say, well, there is an American school and a British school. Well, that's only so that it can be called international. Quite frankly, it's like the American <laughs> baseball series. You know, you have like Cuban team or, I don't know, uh, Dominican Mexican team, Mexican team, and then you are allowed American to call it team. at the World Series, right? But it isn't like, I mean, IPE is totally US-centered. I mean, and the, the, the British only exist as a sort of, you know, yeah, anyway. So I mean, I think that there is an element of, of, of definitely that. On the stock market and, and, and retirement funds, I would simply say that if you are, I mean, basically, the best retirement funds are pay as you go. The existing the uh, working population supports the existing dependent population, as we do with children as well. I mean, all dependents are supported by existing working people. All sorts, I mean, you can perhaps have an element of finance in it, uh, but only if the financial system to which it is harnessed is a productive financial system. Back in, uh, before 1914, when Hilferding wrote Finance Capital, he explicitly contrasted the continental system, which was geared towards long-term industrial investment, and the British system, which was short-term finance. Uh, and I also explain how, uh, as a, a part of the uh, uh, development, I mean, in, in fact, Marx completely expected, if you read the chapter to which Henry was referring uh, in volume three, um, Marx fully expected that uh, uh, they would be the continental type. The financial system of capitalism would naturally be of the continental type. But, and I explain in my book why this did not happen. I, I can't say more uh, at this point. Um, on, on this point, I, I agree. Of course, what I'm saying sounds completely counterintuitive. And all I'm saying is if you have any doubt about it, you will want to read my book because it will then explain to you, uh, it will then explain to you that in fact there is, there is a lot behind your doubt. 
you know, so that's one thing. Producing differently, I couldn't agree more. I talk about industrial policy, but industrial policy does not mean that we are going to reconstruct the dark satanic mills. You can have an industrial policy for the theater sector, just as much as you can have an industrial policy for the uh, uh, for, 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 for a st the steel sector, or the, an industrial policy for, for, for your education sector or whatever. Industrial policy is just a term that covers the idea that there is some, there is some deliberate uh, uh, social or political I, the decisions made about exactly what we want to do in our education, exactly what we want to do in our environmental technology sector, or in our cultural sector, or in our basic steel and engineering sector, because quite frankly, we can't live without that. Even if we don't have cars, we will need subways, we will need uh, uh, railways and, and whatever. So we need to produce these things. One minute on the macro and one minute on the two minutes on the stress. <laughs> uh, I haven't got a book, but I, I do macro stuff and I've got articles in academic journals. And uh, basically our argument is that, you know, in, in 25 words or less, that Lenin once said, capitalism can get through any crisis as long as the working class is willing to, you know, yeah. allow it to. Yeah. And so the value of labor power in Greece is collapsing. The value of labor power in Spain is collapsing. And the rate of exploitation in the United States is huge. And so no matter what the debt is, as long as the working class is willing to pay for it, okay. through debt, through wages falling relative to productivity, we see no reason why the crisis won't, the, the capitalism won't survive this. It's a political question, not an economic question as far as we're concerned. Uh, the U.S. capitalist class is sitting on $5 trillion at this moment of unspent profits. And it can't find profitable outlets, but so what? Right? I mean, it's, it's in power and its profits are high, and the question is, at what point will they find a place for capital accumulation? So far, they're in command and control. Stress. The way we deal with stress is that um, most people think of um, the executives of having the most stress. We know, of course, when you look at endocrine disorder, you look at the endocrine results, you discover it is the lower you are in the corporate hierarchy, the more hormones or you know, endocrine problems that you're having, and that's one of the reasons why uh, people at the bottom have much higher cancer rates, uh, much higher heart disease rates, because it creates sticky blood, as some a number of um, endocrinologists have argued, and this sticky blood contributes to heart disease, contributes to cancer. And so it is a class issue again. So people at the top, even people at the top who smoke and eat bad diets, live much longer. And a huge factor there has to be the epidemiological constitution, which stress imposes on the environment the other environmental factors so that's the way we deal with in the book we don't have a mental health chapter and i would say in the union movement where i was involved in britain it ended up in this civil servant type job where i would say something like 80 percent of the cases that we had to handle were people who had seriously been damaged or in one or two cases killed as a result of low level stress caused by the managerial regime now we have a little more time. We have somebody who wants to ask a question. I've got two people. Is there anybody else who wants to chip in? So we have three. I'm going to take these three, and I'm really going to give you up to ten past seven. I only have a few observations, observations to make. <coughs> bases all over the world. I remember at a, at a forum right here a couple of years ago is that in the continent of Africa, and this is probably with Mr. Obama being in the White House, is that there are about 40 military bases over there. Also, he has started a relationship with Australia. Why would he be over there? if it's not for him wanting to keep a lid on China. See, and the way I look at it is, is that most wars are economically driven. Now, when we talk about free trade in the late 19th century, the U.S. was a protectionist country. After World War I, and she became a creditor country, then she was going to, then she became a free trade nation. Why did she become a free trade nation? 
because according to standard international economics, she had a comparative advantage. Now, getting <laughs> to England, okay, is that I noticed that when um, Bush decided to invade Iraq, who was behind him but his good buddy Tony Blair, okay? And I remember watching this movie, um, Pat, and he said that after the Second World War, it would be England and America. They would be the top boys, okay? So, Blair supported uh, um, Dumb Bush when he went into uh, when he went into Iraq, and why why did he go into Iraq? Is because Saddam Hussein wanted the nations uh, in the Middle East to accept payments and. In, uh, in, in, in euros instead of dollars. So we know that Bush wasn't bright enough to understand the ramifications of that. But somebody wanted to invite us. Huh? 1991, there was no euro. Uh, the second invasion or the first? They went the into the first. Uh, no, no. Bush, we're talking about Bush too. Oh, okay. In 2003. But they wanted to go into, the, they went into uh, Iraq because of Saddam. He had too much influence over there, too much control. Last week, get the other two. Okay, number two is that I told a friend of mine when I heard that uh, Gaddafi wanted to have a Euro unified currency in Africa, I told him, I said, Gaddafi is a dead man. I said, you must always look at the economic ramifications of these movies. Okay, that's all I want to say. My question is a general question. Do you feel that capitalism is the only religion, or does socialism have a chance to witness what's happening in South America and Venezuela, and Argentina's refusal to pay back their debts, and their survival today, and their prospering? Uh, even more than in the past. So uh, is capitalism the only religion that we worship? Or is there a chance for another religion? As long as the South Americans stick together, yes. Can we have respect for uh, um, In the discussion about the future of capitalism, I'm kind of surprised, unless I missed it somehow, that there's not more of a discussion about the uh, power of multinational corporations and the decline in the power of the governments and nationalism of nations. And you know, there's a book out uh, only a few months ago called How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World. Oh, and, the, yeah. and the question of really who's running the world, is it the government or is it the corporations? You know what I'm going to do now? Corporate. I'm going to say, do you know where you're going to get the answer to these questions? <laughs> you're going to come back next? No, no. I'm not going to say what you think. You're going to come back next year, but we'll have another panel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. That's okay. Thank you. That's right.